We'd like to acknowledge that our videos are filmed on unceded and unsurrendered traditional Algonquin territory. We'd like to thank the Algonquin Nation for hosting us on their land. Hi everyone, welcome back to our winter module series here at the OCDSB Outdoor Education Centres. Again, my name is Lindsay and we are so excited to have you join us again in our outdoor classroom. Today I am starting off this video at McSkimming Outdoor Education Centre in the East End and wow, have we gotten a lot of snow over the last couple of days. If you remember back to last week's video, David explained to us why we experience our winter season here in Ottawa. And with winter comes a lot of different conditions. Uh, a lot of snow instead of rain. We start losing our lakes and our rivers because they become frozen uh, and a layer of ice forms on top, which changes the access that animals and other people have to water. Uh, we also tend to have quite windy and cold temperatures. That's why you get a wind chill with your weather often throughout the winter. And temperatures really decrease or drop, often below zero. And all of these conditions cause uh, us to have to adapt or change our behavior so that we can survive and be comfortable throughout this season. I know my behavior changes as we head into our winter season. I often start wearing a lot more clothing than I would wear maybe in the summertime. I've got my toque and my gloves, and I even have a couple different layers underneath my jacket here. I'm also wearing sweat pant, uh, snow pants, and maybe you noticed these big clunky things on my feet today. I am wearing snowshoes to help me to be able to walk more easily through this deep, deep snow that we have here at McSkimming. Now, what are some of the changes that you make in order to prepare for winter? Maybe some of you start spending more time indoors where you have heat source to keep you warm. Maybe you sleep a little more than you might in the summer. We aren't the only ones who have to make changes to adapt and prepare for winter. As we have been observing species, living things throughout the fall, uh, we have grouped the strategies that different living things might use to survive the winter or respond to winter conditions into three main categories or groups. Now, the first one, Christine already mentioned last week in our video when she was talking about the chickadees and the birds. Uh, does anyone remember what that M word was? It's used to talk about animals that leave one area to move to another area, often maybe down south. If you guessed migration, that's what I'm referring to. So migration is one of the three strategies that um, animals will often use in order to kind of deal with winter. They try to escape it. The other strategy basically involves all of the animals and living things that are left here behind. We break that into two categories. So for the animals that are still here, uh, you either have an, animals and beings that are in an active state or an inactive state. For the living things that go into an inactive state, uh, we will be sharing a couple of examples from around the centers. And often you might think of animals that go into a long winter sleep or a hibernation. Have you heard that word before? Now, for the animals that decide to stay awake during this time, they have also come up with different strategies in order to allow them to survive and thrive during these times here uh, in Ottawa. So we are very, very excited to uh, get into this video and share with you some of the things that we've been observing here at the outdoor centers. When I think about adaptations, there is one group of organisms or animals that really comes to mind for me, and that is the group of insects. Right? They're just amazing. There's so many classic examples of the adaptations they have. I mean, think about the praying mantis, for example. Maybe you've never seen one in real life, but you can imagine that, that kind of a structure and all of the ways that it, it must have developed over time to, to that shape to be able to survive. <clears throat> now, in winter, we can't forget about the insects. 
In fact, when you go out on a winter day, <clears throat> that might be one of the, the things that you recognize is the absence of insects. You might not be aware of it, but you're not reaching up and smacking up mosquitoes. <clears throat> you're not out watching the butterflies on that day. And it, we probably don't recognize it most of the time. But insects have to deal with winter too. They have some amazing adaptations. Um, and I'd like to talk about some things that you may be familiar with. So let's look at the monarch butterfly. Now back in the fall, before we had any of this snow, we were exploring what insects were doing to get ready for winter. And I'd like to go back to a clip of Lindsay explaining to us a little bit more about the monarch butterfly. So another really important thing going on in the fall here in Ontario is the monarch butterfly migration. And at this point, um, a lot of the butterflies may have already made it out of Ontario, but we are still seeing some lingering monarchs who are again feeding on asters uh, and goldenrod and the other last blooming plants of the fall so that they can get the energy they need in order to make it all the way to Mexico. Monarch butterflies are kind of rare in the insect world in that they're able to move away and they do migrate. Migration isn't, isn't a huge thing in the insect world really, or in general. Um, we tend to associate it with birds and, and large mammals for the most part, but insects need to be able to deal with winter. And if we're thinking of the monarch butterfly, it's a really good place to start to recall the insect life cycle. I'm sure you've studied it at some point in your school career and learned about how they change. Maybe you've watched a butterfly and you've started with a plant that has some eggs on it. Watch those eggs develop into a little caterpillar right, or the larval stage and then pupate or go into a cocoon and then arise from that as a butterfly from its chrysalis. I know I've done that with many students in the past and it's, it's amazing to be able to see those changes. If you think about that, insects tend to be only adapted to survive the winter at one of those stages of their lives. And monarchs leave the area. Most others remain here. For example, the morning cloak is one that remains here as an adult, and it might find a tree like this one that has a hollow cavity that it can get up inside, but it is still alive, and enters a kind of a hibernation state learn about hibernation we realize there are different levels of it. It's not, there are true hibernators and others that enter a, a very dormant or a, a kind of a sleep state in the winter to make it through. Now these morning cloaks though will survive and then in those first, first uh, warm days in the spring when the sun is out uh, early there could still be snow on the ground you can see the morning cloaks come out in their adult form and mate and will lay eggs in the spring and they'll be one of that f the first butterflies that we see. Hey everyone, it's me again. I thought I'd just jump in here and talk about that big H word that David just mentioned. Do you know which word I'm talking about? Hibernation. So that is yet another strategy, of course, that animals use in order to cope with winter. And we use the word hibernation to describe uh, usually a long period of dormancy or sleep and rest that lasts months. It's a really great survival strategy for conserving energy um, because it uses, for us um, warm-blooded creatures, it uses a lot of energy trying to maintain our warm body temperature of 30 something degrees when we have below temperatures outside. To add to that, um, it's also quite difficult to be finding other things that you need to survive, like food and water at this time of year. So why not just sleep the whole winter away? Um, and then you don't have to worry about finding food, uh, you use way less energy, and when you wake up in the spring, you can go back to life as usual again, and you've passed this tough season. Now, when you think of hibernation, what is the first creature that often comes to mind? For me, it's a bear. Now, bears, we use uh, hibernation to describe what they do in the winter, um, but they actually go into a torpor. So it's not a true hibernation. Uh, it's a sleep of a couple days to weeks at a time, and then they'll wake up periodically throughout that season. Animals that go into a true hibernation 
their heart rate drops, their metabolism drops, their breathing rate drops, and their body temperature really goes down. For some of these creatures, their body temperature goes to close to almost freezing. And bears, their body temperature only drops just a couple degrees. And they easily wake up in the winter time uh, when maybe somebody's disturbing their den or the temperatures warm up just a little bit outside. Now, when we talk about hibernation and we use that general term, uh, there's also another species here at the centers and all across Ontario that I love to think about when it comes to preparing for winter, especially after what we saw back here at the man-made lake in the fall. Take a look at this video. Had you ever thought about what turtles do in the winter time in order to survive? So turtles also go into a form of hibernation, what we call their hibernation brumation. All reptiles go into a brumation here in the province. So that includes snakes as well. And they're ectothermic. So as the temperatures start dropping in the fall, they really start to slow down, sort of like you saw in that video that we just played for you. And um, as that happens, they'll, they'll stop eating probably two weeks before they go into their pure dormant state. Now in the winter, in their full brumation state, uh, they only have one heartbeat for every 10 minutes of time that passes by. How cool is that? So turtles in the fall, as their bodies start to slow down, they are going to find a nice spot just down at the bottom of a river, um, maybe at the bottom of the man-made lake. Now below this thick layer of ice, there is still lots and lots of water for the creatures who live under here to survive. That doesn't actually freeze. It stays just in its water state. Now this morning, it is a chilly minus 17 out here above the ice where I'm standing uh, with a wind chill of minus 27. It is cold, but below the ice, the water is never going to get colder than about four degrees Celsius. So it's actually quite a bit warmer under the ice than it is for me up here above the ice today. So this is good for all of the creatures that live down there because they won't actually freeze. They're just gonna be cold. Uh, and they actually usually don't mind those temperatures too much. Turtles have yet another cool adaptation that allows them to be able to breathe while they're swimming and not able to come up through the ice for air uh, all winter long. And this could be a period of sometimes up to six months where they don't need to come up for a breath of air. And that is because they specialized skin on their throats and on this little opening near their tail called the cloaca. These specialized skin cells are able to exchange oxygen uh, that is in the water below the ice here. So all winter long, uh, they're not, again, remember they're not breathing a whole lot, but they're still moving and they're still down there and alive and well, uh, but they are able just to pull enough oxygen out of the water, dissolved oxygen that's in there, and then exchange that carbon dioxide back out. They really are incredible creatures. So in the spring, as soon as the ice starts to melt and uh, the sun starts to warm up their bodies again, that will start bringing them back out of their state of sleep or rest and uh, brumation. My challenge to you this week is to think about more creatures than what we've talked about today in this video uh, who live in the Ottawa region and what strategies they use in order to survive winter. To help you with this, we have created a sorting activity, uh, which you can access in the description box below this video. It's created in Jamboard, so many of you within the OCDSB should be able to access this. And you can do this activity as a class or individually. And this is just to kind of uh, test your knowledge and push your boundaries of what you think these animals do in order to survive winter. This even was challenging for us as outdoor education staff. Now, we haven't added all of the creatures that live here within this region. So if you want to challenge yourself beyond that, I would encourage you to think about other species, maybe ones that we haven't mentioned in today's video, and try to figure out how they survive the winter season. All right, 
Now we're going to send you back to David who's going to continue talking about insects. Now other insects spend the winter in one of the other life stages and survive in that state. They have many amazing ways to do that. If you look around you can see that I'm in a bit of a field. It's kind of overgrown and it's full of goldenrod and it's this goldenrod is no longer alive, being winter. Um, next year we'll have some more here again. But as I look around on these dead stems of the goldenrod, I'm finding a lot of little balls like this. There's one here, there's one down here that you can see. It's just a like a little ball right in the center of the, the stem. And this is another way that a type of insect spends the winter and is able to survive. So by laying its eggs into the stem of the developing plant. The response of the plant is to grow this tissue around it. And those eggs will develop into a little larva or a, essentially a worm or a caterpillar that grows up inside there and actually feeds on the plant tissue. Inside is nourished by the plant and is protected in this ball. What I'd like to do is to take this gall back inside where it's a little bit warmer and we can dissect it or cut it right in half and investigate how that plant tissue forms in response to the insect. Well, we should be able to find that developing larva still inside the gall too, get a closer look at it uh, and what you might expect to find in the many variety of galls that you can find here in the Ottawa area. So come with me inside, let's check it out. It's, it's pretty, it's like almost filled with foam on the inside there, but it, it's got the hard or woody outer layer. And this larva will overwinter and then uh, when things start to warm up, it will burrow a little tunnel, it'll chew its way up to the very edge here, then go in and, and pupate and become an adult and then will emerge from a tiny little hole on at the edge of that tunnel that it's already dug for itself. Now in this case, I don't see any holes. I'm assuming that the larva is in there now and is overwintering. It's about minus 20 degrees Celsius right now out here. It is darn cold, but inside there that it's just warm enough that that insect is well protected. And this is one way that those insects overwinter in that particular life stage, that larval stage, and survive until the spring when they can continue their life. If you have open fields somewhere near where you live and you've noticed these yellow flowers in the late summer and, and the fall, then ch check it out. Go see if you can find some of these goldenrod galls and you might be amazed at just how many are there that we've always overlooked before. And keep in mind there are many, many kinds of insect galls, so you can find them on all sorts of different plants. And usually the insect that makes that gall is specific. It only uses that one plant. It's a kind of a relationship that they've developed over time, an adaptation that they have to survive the winter. My challenge for you this week is to get out and explore your neighborhood, continue exploring your neighborhood and try to find evidence of the insects that are overwintering there. If you have access to a hand lens, something like this, it's a helpful tool to be able to investigate more closely some of the areas you might want to search for insects. For instance, on this bark, I might want to get in here and really look closely at what's under these raised parts of the bark. There's, and I start to notice some other cool things as I do this too. So as you get out, explore, look for those insects in all their different life stages. The adults where they might be hiding and trying to survive the winter and stay just warm enough. Maybe some of the galls or other plant formations where you know there's an egg just waiting to the springtime inside there. Uh, or even just imagine, because we need to use our imaginations a lot, imagine all the places where they could be and keep that in mind for your further explorations in the spring and see if you make a connection. Let's take a look now as David and Joanne explore a scene of some animal evidence out at Mech Skimming. Can you figure out what this animal is doing to prepare for winter? Okay, we can see. The size of it compared to Duane. They clearly sit up here and there's 
stuff shoved in every crevice here. <laughs> As we look around. Holes in the ground. Activity back and forth to So we're here in the forest where uh, we've been exploring and we've been able to uh, watch this site over the fall and notice a red squirrel start to uh, build its winter cache here. And so in the stump behind me and in all of these underground chambers, this red squirrel has stashed their food. Now we know it's a red squirrel because we've been able to observe it, but also because red squirrels will hide their food a little bit different than other types of squirrels. So they hide their food in one giant food cache and they'll maintain all of these openings throughout the winter so that they can access their food. And we can see even since the last snow in the background, we can see that the squirrels have been feeding and these holes show that the squirrels have been going in and out and we can see around uh, the edge of the holes, there's some ice. So we know that there's heat underneath there. So uh, it's creating some ice along the opening of the, of the hole. And so this cache will support the squirrels throughout the winter. And it's filled with pine cones. Uh, if you lived in an area where there were other types of nuts, they would include those in their cache. But this one's mostly uh, pine cones from the conifers that are around this area. We have been talking about uh, squirrels that cache their food and store food for winter. And now I'm here uh, at the Bill Mason Center. I'm on the, the man-made lake. And so underneath this layer of snow is actually ice. And underneath that, some water from the lake. And so there's a thick layer of ice. And we've been lucky enough to this fall be able to watch a family of beavers gathering their food store for the winter. So just like the squirrel, the beaver will stay active through the winter, uh, but it does most of its food storage in the fall. So all fall we've watched it gathering food from the shore and it takes mostly deciduous trees. So deciduous trees are the trees that lose their leaves in the fall and beavers will eat those upper branches because that's where most of the nutrition in the tree is. So in order to get to those branches, the beaver will use its sharp teeth to chop down the tree. As it falls, it takes all the branches and brings it down here to the lake. And it actually stores its food in the water because it wants its food cache to be kind of close to its lodge. And so its lodge is behind me here on the shore. And you can even see it's been a little bit warm. So you can see that uh, the beavers have kept a little hole open because they may have been coming and going from that. But once it gets cold, they'll spend most of their days inside their lodge. And so they'll go inside their lodge and they've built it so that it kind of has a room that's up above the water. So they'll use the water entrance and they'll go up and they'll, they'll stay up inside a, a warm place in their lodge and it will keep them safe from predators throughout the winter months. And then when they want to eat, they can get to their food cache from underneath 
the ice. So they'll go underneath the ice and they'll gnaw off some branches and bring them back to their lodge to eat. And so this is kind of like your refrigerator. So I know it looks like just a bunch of branches, but because we got to witness the beaver gathering it, we know that this is a beaver's food cache for the winter. So its refrigerator is nice and close so it can doesn't have to use a lot of energy to get to its food. And so it'll be able to get through the winter by being a little bit less active. It'll stay mostly inside its lodge, uh, but it doesn't hibernate. So it'll still be awake and needing food. We've been talking about how animals survive winter. We've talked about insects. We've talked about turtles and snakes. But there's something here in the forest that we haven't talked about. It's around me. We haven't talked about what the plants are doing. And so my challenge to you is to when you go outside this week, look around your neighborhood at the plants that are in your neighborhood. So look at the trees and there's two different types of trees. One that's still green and one that has already lost its leaves for winter. I want you to figure out the different strategies that they're using to make it through the cold temperatures. So how are they surviving winter? So that's my challenge to you this week, is to figure out what our plants are doing. And we'll come back to talking about them in our follow-up video next, when we see each other next. Can you see me? I'm hiding. What about now? Can you see me now? Why are bright colors not great in winter? Is there anything happening behind me? Is there any other animal or creature? Oh, did you see that? Why not? This is a perfect example. Animals want to blend in with their surroundings. What's that called? Do you know? Camouflage, that's right. Why was I not very well camouflaged? I'm wearing bright colors, of course. I could try as hard as I want and I would still stand out. Being an animal in the forest, being really brightly colored, or even an opposite color of their surrounding makes them stand out. And that's not great if you're a creature that could get eaten. You don't want to be prey, do you? So if like my friend David, he's gone now, but like my friend David, he blended in with the trees. You couldn't see him very well, even though he was right behind me the whole time. He camouflaged with his surroundings. If David were an animal, he would be much safer for many predators than I would be. Examples of animals that camouflage in winter are the snowshoe hare. In the spring and summer, and even into the fall, their fur is brown, allowing them to blend into whatever's going on behind them. As the days get shorter and there's less sunlight as winter comes, the snowshoe hare's fur starts to turn white, allowing them to blend in, camouflage, with the surroundings in the winter time. In the seasons that we've been having snow longer and later into spring, we often will see a brown snowshoe hare on a white background of snow. Same thing happens in the winter. We've had some winters where we don't even have snow till January here in Ottawa. And that's really crazy because then sometimes we can see white snowshoe hare just running across the field and they stand out. That's not great for them because they're a lot more visible to their predators. Other animals, the predators, also use camouflage for their survival. The ermine, for example, is a weasel-like creature that is brown in the summer and fall and turns white in the winter. This allows it to hunt its prey a lot easier. They can just sneak up on their prey with hopefully not being seen or detected. I have a little experiment I'd like to try with you all. We're talking about adaptations and how animals survive winter. You may not know it, but snow is considered an insulator. Insulators are something that keep us warm, like my thick puffy jacket. And snow can help animals survive 
even the coldest nights of winter. So I'd like to try a little experiment with you. I have something to mark the location I'm trying this experiment. It doesn't have to be a flag on a stick. You could get a little stick and mark your spot in the snow where you're doing this experiment or a marker, something that you can stick in the ground near where we're doing our experiment so you can remember where you did it. Because depending on where you've gone, it's sometimes easy to lose our spot when there's snow everywhere and everything looks the same. So I'm gonna stick my flag in the ground so I know that this is the area where I'm doing my little test. Now I have two little containers. Each container is filled with water. They don't have to be little, they could be any size that you want. Um, and these are going to be considered our little mice. Mice, voles, shrews are all so small little creatures that use the snow to help them survive in the winter time. Now, really what we're looking at focusing on is the subnivian layer. What that really means is the layer of snow between here and the ground underneath. And what we're going to do is we're going to just dig a little hole. I just made a little mark there, push down with my mitten, and we're gonna put one of our little mice down in that hole. I might actually dig it a little bit deeper to make sure that I'm as close to the ground as possible. Oh yeah, that snow's a lot deeper than I thought. You wanna get as close to the ground as you can because that's the area. Oh, I saw a little bit of grass and leaves. That's the area where our little mice and shrews and voles are gonna be spending their time close to the ground where they can eat some of that grass and they build tunnels to travel underneath the snow. So now I'm gonna cover it back up with the snow. I'm not going to pack it down because the snow wasn't packed down already. I'm just gonna cover it back up and that's going to be our mouse that's living under the snow and under the ground. Our second little mouse, oh no, we're gonna leave on top of the snow. I'm gonna put it close to the flag there. And we're going to leave this for a couple of hours as if it's actually spending that time out in the snow. We're gonna come back in a couple hours and see what happens to our mouse on top of the snow versus our mouse that's buried underneath the snow in that subnivian layer. My challenge to you this week is to find a couple little containers, find some deep snow, dig down to the bottom through that subnivian layer, bury one of your little containers or your mice, cover it up, leave one on top, and leave it for a day or even overnight. Go back and visit it. Don't forget to mark the spot so you can find it and check back next week so we can compare results. Thanks so much for joining us for our first module focusing on winter adaptations. If you have any questions, we encourage you in your class to ask your teacher to fill out the form. The link is in the video description below. If you, as a class, submit your top five questions, we're going to try to address as many of them as we can in next week's follow-up video. Thanks again for tuning in. We hope to see you next week.